I've got some successful social media pages. I'm no rich e-celeb or anything, but I've got tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of followers and subscribers on my different social media pages. Because of this, I have my fair share of weirdos who message me constantly, and I've even been doxxed, but I've never really felt unsafe. I joined one of those free dating websites, I won't tell you which one, and left out any links to my social media. I didn't want that to influence whether someone messaged me or not. I wasn't sure if anyone would recognize me. A lot of my subscribers and followers are from different countries. Well, after some obvious catfish and troll messages, I got one that looked promising. She was a bit older than me, and seemed to have her life together. She had a kid from a previous relationship, but at the time, I didn't think of that as a problem. She had a normal service job and worked for one of those ride-sharing apps on the side. The way she talked, at least through her messages, seemed more mature than the girls who would send me DMs on Twitter. If she recognized me from social media, she never mentioned it. We talk about whatever was happening that day, send each other selfies, all the usual stuff. We talked online for a long time, maybe about three months, occasionally making plans to meet in real life, but it never really panned out. That was mostly my fault. My social media pages were basically my full-time job. After a few cancelled meetups, she asked me if I was serious about her. Well, I wasn't terribly serious, but I didn't want to cut her off or ghost her or anything like that. I appreciated the company, thought we had chemistry, and really thought when we finally got to meet, we'd work well together. When I explained this to her, she was immediately apologetic for even asking. I thought that was weird, but I felt kind of bad too. I guess her patience was running out, because half of the messages that she had sent me from then on were bitter and accusatory, and even outright mean sometimes. But every time that I'd say it seems like it isn't going to work out, she would apologize in a way that was almost like begging, and give different kinds of excuses for her behavior that would make me feel sorry for her. Much later, I learned that this was a manipulation tactic, but at the time, I fell for it over and over. Sometime later, the messages would slow down, nearly stopping completely. While I liked that woman for the most part, if she had lost interest, what choice did I have, right? Three other women would message me in pretty much that same week, but there was something weird about their profiles. They were all obvious catfish, I thought, but the profiles had all been made within the same day, the day before they messaged me. I knew right away what was going on. They were all her. They had to be. If she was going to mess with me like this, I was going to mess with her. I sent one of the obviously fake profiles a message saying, Wow, you're so cute. The cutest person I've met on this site. Would you like to meet up right now? Like clockwork, the woman I had been talking to video called me within seconds of me sending that message. I answered, and she said, Sorry for the lack of messages, I've just been busy. <laughs> yeah, busy harassing me with a bunch of fake profiles. She asked what I was doing and if I could meet her that day. I said, no, I have a lot of work to do. She said, I see, loudly and clearly upset, and hung up. With impressive speed, I received another message from the fake profile. It said, lol, no thanks, I just heard from my friend what a huge jerk you are, and I could never see someone like you. At this point, I had had enough of this game and blocked all of her profiles, real and fake. A day later, I got a message from one of my friends about some weird comments on my Instagram. When I checked, sure enough, all the profiles were using the pictures from her catfish profiles. Most of the comments were just insults. Why would anyone follow this guy? His content sucks. Stuff like that. But a few comments were revealing information about my family and friends. That crossed a line. After deleting a ton of it, blocking and reporting her, a lot of my friends and followers did the same. Her last attempt to get at me was messaging one of my best friends, telling him that I made her so, so upset that her and everyone else who knows me should do something about me. 
I don't know if that was supposed to be a threat or what, but we just laughed about it when he showed me. These days, when I get especially nasty comments on one of my photos or videos, I always think it's her on a new profile. I almost feel bad for her, dealing with whatever it is that makes her act like this. Yeah, maybe I wasn't blameless for never making time to meet her, but after a reaction like that, I'm grateful every day that I never did. During my college years, I met a guy I went to school with, and he felt like someone I could be friends with. We had two of the same classes, and we helped each other with work, and even worked on a few projects together. We also had lunch together every day, and we became good friends. Both of our interests aligned pretty well, too. This might have been the perfect series of things to tell us that we should be together, and we listened to that. We started dating after the first few classes we had together. We also each had a year left before we graduated, and we helped each other achieve that. I did have that thought in the back of my mind, though, that everything seemed a little too perfect, and it might have been too good to be true. There was an unnerving feeling that I couldn't put my finger on, but I might have just been blind to how fast life was going. After we graduated, we moved into a small house with each other because neither of our parents wanted us back home with them. We both got work way outside of our fields that we went to school for, of course, but at least we found something. It was a bit of a struggle, but I noticed something that made it even more difficult. Our money wasn't adding up. Some of it was disappearing, and we couldn't account for where it was all going. My money was fine, but his was almost down to nothing, and all the bills pretty much fell on me. I lived with him for about a year before I found out what the secret was that he was keeping from me. He was using. I had no idea, but suddenly small things he would do made sense. I'm not going to list them off, but he had small things that he did that I never really questioned, but they seemed odd to me. I tried to talk to him about it, but he tried to deny it, and even though I saw proof, he'd still deny it. I felt unsafe around things of that nature, so I told him to either clean up or I pack up. He still denied it, so I left. It was extremely difficult for me to do, but I wasn't going to stay there in an unsafe environment. I reluctantly went back to my parents' house, as they reluctantly let me stay with them. It was the circumstances that helped me out with that. I would rather have just gone and gotten another place, but there wasn't any in the area. I would have had to move out of state. I stayed at my parents' house for the better part of another year, but during that time, he wouldn't leave me alone. We had split on a bad note, but I thought that was just going to be the end of it. He knew where my parents lived because we had visited them a few times. He knew where I'd gone, and he showed up. He knocked on the window of my old room that I was still staying in, and I opened it to tell him that it was over. He immediately started with it, begging me to go back with him because he couldn't do this alone. I argued with him out the window over it a little bit, and he got mad and picked something up in the yard and threw it at my window. I got scared and slammed the window shut and closed the curtains. I could hear him outside yelling, but eventually he stopped and left. If there was ever a chance of us getting back together, it was gone after that. I wanted him out of my life, but he would still come over to my parents' house and bother me. I got to where I didn't want to go anywhere or do anything because the fear that I might run into him or that he was watching me from someplace. For all I knew... He could have been hanging out nearby, waiting to make a move. He did, too. I merely went to the store to get food, and he sprang out of nowhere and started begging me again. That quickly turned into a woe-is-me thing, and the only thing I had in the back of my mind was that I needed to get away from him before he turned dangerous. Thankfully, some guy came out of nowhere and asked if I needed help, and that gave me the second that I needed to slip away. He didn't follow me home, 
but I didn't go into the store either. I just went straight home. Later, he showed back up at my parents' house and beat on the wall outside until I answered. My mom heard this going on and called the police in the other room, thinking that someone was trying to break into the house. They showed up, and I told them that he had been told to leave and wouldn't. He acted like I had betrayed him when I said that, but they made him leave regardless. He stopped coming over but started trying to call me instead, but I refused to answer the phone. He even tried to call me on private numbers, but I saw right through that. I even let my voicemail fill all the way up and I refused to clean it out. I moved out of my parents' house and changed my phone number. That was the last time he bothered me and thankfully so. I still can't believe someone would be bothered that much to try to win a person back that no longer wants anything to do with them. I don't think I'm in the wrong for thinking about my safety, and I will stand on that hill as long as I live. My name is Caitlin, and I'm a sophomore in high school. I'm about 5'4 with short blonde hair and brown eyes. Everyone tells me I'm cute. I love swimming, tennis, and soccer. I was at my school some weekends for after-school stuff, but I was never without company. Team members were always together having fun. That was about the point a tragedy struck my life. My dad was on his way home one evening when it was raining very hard and was hit by a drunk driver. Dad's car hit a tree and he died. The drunk? Nothing. Only a few scratches. Mom and I were devastated. After the trial, Mom couldn't stand living in our house or town anymore. Everything reminded her of him. So we moved closer to Mom's parents in another state. Mom transferred her job while working long hours. Grandma and Grandpa worked during the week and were also home late. On weekends, they were involved in community events. I would go sometimes and watch them. Going to these outings made me feel better, so I started going often. I was meeting people, and some were even my age. I guess I was beginning to make friends. My new school was very small, but had curriculum activities like my old one, which I missed so much, especially my friends. My old friends and I still talked a lot online. Since these guys grew up together, it was kind of hard to join in. After all, I was an outsider. One Saturday, Grandma and I were selling baked goods at a social event when a neighbor came up and started talking to Grandma. He was about 40 with black hair that had gray streaks at his temples. He was short, fat, and sweated a whole lot. He was wearing tan hiking shorts and a blue pullover shirt with white diamond-shaped patterns. He also had thick black rim glasses that he kept pushing up with his middle right finger. He was telling her stupid corny jokes that he was laughing at himself. They weren't funny, but Grandma would giggle a little bit. You could tell she didn't even think them funny either. Every once in a while, he would look at me and stare. He began giving me the creeps. Grandma introduced us. His name was Jim. I was glad when some of the girls that I met came over and asked if I was hungry. Grandma shooed me off. At school I was beginning to hang out with the boys and girls I met at the weekend events. Amanda and I were beginning to become friends, and soon we were spending time with her friends, and life was beginning to become normal again. Amanda was about three blocks from where I was living. After school, I would often spend time at her house doing homework. Amanda's mom worked mornings, so she could be at home when school let out. Sometimes I would walk to her house on Saturdays if Grandma didn't have anything for me to help with. Sundays, I always spent at home with Mom. One afternoon, I was walking home from Amanda's house. We were doing a project for English class. Our class was to do research and then create visual display of our findings. We kept our project at her house so I didn't have to carry it back and forth. 
This was just after 6 p.m. It was beginning to get really dark. It gets dark here in the winter early, so I wanted to be home before it really turned dark. As I was walking home, I was thinking about how my life had changed over the last year and wasn't paying attention to anything, just enjoying the walk. When I got to the corner, I waited for the car to go by before walking across. Halfway through the intersection, the car stopped, sat for a few minutes, and then left. It was a fairly new black Nissan Rogue. The headlight on the passenger side was dimmer than the other one. I don't know why exactly, but my whole body went on high alert. Walking didn't seem to be an option, so I began to run. When I got to the second corner, there was the car again, sitting there waiting on me. Before I got to the corner though, it turned left and went on down the street. I relaxed, thinking that maybe the driver was looking for an address. I continued on home without seeing it again. Maybe I was overreacting. I didn't think about the car or the fact that it had stopped in front of me in the middle of the street and had forgotten about it until the next afternoon on my way home. As I was getting ready to cross the second corner, the black Nissan stopped and sat there. It sat there for a few minutes longer than necessary before slowly driving on. Back on high alert, before I got halfway across the street, I noticed that the car was following slowly behind me. I thought about running, but then I thought, no, I better not. The next day I told Amanda and the others who I ate lunch with. They all offered up suggestions and possibilities, and then we had a good laugh. All was fine until that afternoon going home. There at the second corner was the black Nissan, sitting as if it were waiting for me. The car started across the street and stopped halfway. The window was down, and a man's voice asked if I needed a ride home. I kept walking as if I didn't hear him. The car turned down the street I was walking on and followed me until the third corner, and then sped away. When I got to the third corner, another car was coming down the street and stopped next to me. I was about to come apart when I recognized Grandpa's voice. The car turned and went down a side street. When I was in the car, Grandpa looked at me and asked what was wrong. He said I was pale and breathing crazy, as well as shaking. I told him about the car as we drove home. We told Mom and Grandma who called the police. When they arrived, I was asked several questions. I described the car, but didn't know what the man looked like or the license plate number. Not much to go on except that the passenger headlight was dim. I told everyone the next day what had happened. One boy, Caleb, who had his own truck that he drove to school, volunteered to drive me home. However, Ellie had a better idea. She suggested that Caleb and Amanda follow me home, hoping to catch the stalker. It sounded like a good plan. So that afternoon, as I was approaching the second corner again, my stalker was there waiting for me. Again, he stopped halfway down the street, and down came the window. I was still scared. He asked me where I lived and if he could take me home. He even offered to get me a coffee or soda if I wanted. I kept walking knowing that somewhere behind me, my friends had my back. Caleb came down the street honking his truck's horn, causing the man to race away. He stopped next to me and told me to get in. Inside the truck with him and Amanda, I began to feel safe. Amanda stated that she got the license plate number. I called mom and told her what happened. By the time we arrived at my house, the police were already there waiting. Amanda gave them the plate number and they went ahead and ran it. The plate number turned out to belong to one of the weekend's event members, Mr. Coates. He ran a booth next to Grandma's. A few days later, Mom took me to the police station to identify the car. Caleb and Amanda came with us, so they could also. 
We were told that he had a record of stalking girls that were walking alone in a few towns in our area. I was a teenage boy at the time this story takes place. I believe I was around 15 when this happened, although I remember it well. I used to walk to and from school with a pit stop for hanging out with my friends in the middle. I used to hang out at a library in a little town because there were so few places to do so. I'd been walking to school since I started middle school, and I'd never had anything happen. But all of a sudden, this creepy guy started showing up out of nowhere. No one seems to have known who he was or where he came from. I was walking to school one day, and he showed up and slowed way down. I thought he was slowing down because of the 15 mile an hour zone that I was in, but he actually slowed down to a complete stop. Hey, you need a ride? I obviously said no and kept walking. He started to drive at walking speed to keep up with me, and told me it wasn't safe out here and that I should let him give me a ride. I once again said I was fine and didn't need a ride. He stopped and got out which made me stop for some reason. He handed me a piece of paper with a number on it and told me to call it if I needed a ride. What are you, a fucking taxi? I asked him. He said no, he was just that friendly. He drove off and I had to shake the creepiness off. This was an older guy with already gray hair and a thin beard. His head had a huge bald spot and the car was a black sedan probably bought for no more than $4,000, so cheap. It was absolutely creepy that he'd stopped and given me his number, but I just continued on walking. I probably should have walked with someone, but all my friends were coming from the opposite direction, and some were riding. So on my way back from school, that day I was going straight home to play some video games. The guy creeped back by me, and asked if I needed a ride again. Again, I said no, and I won't ever need a ride. This old guy pulls up on the sidewalk and asks, What did you say to me, you little asshole? I told him while walking away that he was creepy, and he shouldn't be asking minors to get in the car with him. I walked around his car as he got out, and grabbed me by the wrist. I punched him in the chest, and he let go, so I ran away. He didn't follow me, but then again I did hit him pretty hard because I had something in my hand to firm my grip. I won't say what it was. I probably knocked the wind out of him so he couldn't breathe. So I walked home without any more incidents that day. I told my mom that I had to punch some guy in the chest for grabbing me, but she didn't seem to believe me. She did ask why I smelled like smoke though. So the next day, the creep was there again on the same route. I told myself I'd take another route on the way home. He drove by very slowly, but he didn't stop. I guess I got the message across. I just kept walking, but he stayed right by my side the entire way, until I at least got to where people could see me. Then he just left. I told some of the staff that there was some creep following me to school every day but they didn't do anything about it, or even really listened. If I got kidnapped, it would be the school's fault for not listening. I didn't even mind that my mom sort of brushed it off, but the school pissed me off. Don't call her a bad mom just because she didn't care about that. I only did just tell her that I hit some dude for grabbing me. On the way back home, just like I planned, I took a different route. He found me halfway though. I was going to the library to see friends, but there would also be a police station right across the road. If he wanted to follow me all the way there, I'd just go and tell them. The guy crept next to me in a 35 mile an hour zone and traffic was honking at him to move and passing him when he didn't. I was walking in the grass now and he pulled up beside me. This wasn't smart to do on a busy road. No matter. I was freaking out when he got out of the car again to try to scold me. 
He said he was going to sue me for giving him a heart attack. I said I didn't believe him that he had one because I didn't hit him there. I also said that he shouldn't be grabbing me, and if he did, I'd do worse next time. He got back in his car and spun his wheels at me, flinging dirt and grass all over me. I yelled something at him, but that only made him stop hard in the middle of the road and back up like a guy with a small dick. He started yelling at me that he was going to hit me with his car, and I told him to fucking do it, pedo. He backed up further and then tried to ram me. He pulled away at the last second, though, and sped off. That was the last encounter I had with him face to face. He did follow me to school a few more times, until I started having friends walk with me, and eventually I just started riding to school with one of their moms. The guy disappeared, and no one else seemed to have any information on him. They didn't even see him either. I've since gotten my own license and rode around town looking for his car which I never found. He either came from a different city, or he sold the car. I wanted to find him and give him what he deserves, by getting arrested, but now that's been too long and nothing can be done about it. Maybe if the school had listened, most of that wouldn't have happened. I'm in my 20s now and I've completely moved on from it, but I felt like writing about it would make a good story. Hopefully any teens reading this could benefit from it. I thought nothing could ever happen to me, but it did. And it might not happen to you, but always assume that there could be a possibility. There's no fault in believing anything could happen, and it could save your life one day. I work in an office filing papers and doing data entry. The other female co-workers in this office seem to be really oblivious when it comes to this one guy who still works at the place and just kind of sneaks around being a creep. Otherwise, they just like it. Well, his creeping became stalking when he targeted me for some reason. It was 2018 when he noticed me. I'm the quiet girl in the corner, and nobody really ever talked to me about anything other than work-related stuff. I had my friends outside work, and I had my co-workers separate. I like it like that. So this guy was doing his usual creeper stuff among the other ladies and they were eating it up. So I guess they did like it. After lunch that day, he came up to my desk to I, I guess see that if he could get a rise out of me. But I played it boring. I did the whole, is there anything else? To make it awkward, but he said no. But he hung around the area for a little bit. I went back to ignoring my surroundings and working. The problem didn't get bad until I went to go home. I got in my car in the parking garage, and he popped up next to my window. That startled the shit out of me, and I rolled it down a little bit to see what he wanted. He didn't seem to want anything, but just to scare me and ask me what I was doing. I told him I was going home and going to sleep. He said I was being boring, which is what I was going for, and I turned on my car and backed out. The next day at work, he'd follow me around the office and try to get close enough where I wouldn't notice, but I knew he was there. I eventually called him out for following me around, and he broke the silence. He tried to play it off like he was just coming into the room randomly, but I'd seen him duck behind walls and try to hide. I asked him in the most disconnected tone I could why he was following me around. He told me that he wasn't, and just kept denying it. I didn't want any part of what he was about, so I went back to my desk and kept working. I thought about buying liquid ass to spray around the cubicle, but I'd probably get in trouble for that whether it being spraying something like that or having gas that bad. I'm a very tactical person. So anyway, he kept popping over the top of the cubicle to get peeks. I let him do it for the rest of the day, but it was actually kind of making me uncomfortable. He again followed me through the parking lot that afternoon, walking to my car. 
the moron actually tried to follow me home. I took him around several random streets until he finally got tired of following me and turned off somewhere. I went home after that. I wasn't going to lead him home and I always keep a full gas tank so I have a better chance of outgassing someone. That sounded bad, sorry. When I went to work the next morning, however, he continued to follow me around the office and even got caught a few times. I got tired of this and went to HR. I told them I wanted this to stop. They said that they would need proof that he was following me around, and as annoying as that was, I told them that I would film him doing it. They told me that that would be enough and we agreed that that's what I would do. The entire day, I caught him a few times that he was following me and presented it to HR. The woman in HR told me that she would take care of it and I said I'd hold her to it. After that, he didn't seem interested in me anymore. The HR department talked to him and told him that if he didn't stop, they would do legal things to him. He avoids me like the plague now. If you like this video, consider subscribing. If you are subscribed, hit the bell icon to make sure you never miss an upload. I just have one question for you. Who is that behind you?